church? So we're going to see if this works. And until that starts up, I will use the microphone. So I want to thank Sister Diana for the invitation to speak today from Women's Emphasis Day. And I would also like to thank the pastors for allowing me to speak uh, at this occasion as well. Now, when Diana told me the theme of the day being, Are You Thirsty for Living Water? It reminded me of a book that I had read on another Women's Emphasis Day a number of years ago. And it just said to me that God prepares us for greater things when we do what we think are small things, he prepares us for bigger things down the road. So as we delve into the topic today, I wanted to start off by thanking the Lord for the warm weather that we've had over this past week. And as we know, we did have a heat wave. And when we have such things as a heat wave, what is the one counsel that they advise many individuals? Exactly, to drink water. And why do they say to drink water? Any thoughts? To hydrate, exactly. To drink water, to hydrate. And the reason for that is because our bodies are dependent upon water. It is said that our bodies consist of approximately 60% water. 60%. That is a lot. 60% of water. So when or should you stop drinking water, you will see that there are immediate effects. Effects such as headaches, coherent thoughts vanish, vital organs shut down. So deprive your body of water and your body will tell you. Deprive your soul of spiritual water and your body will tell you. Dehydrated hearts send desperate messages. Tempers, feeling sorry, guilt, hopelessness, loneliness. These are some of the signs or indicators that can tell us that our bodies, our, heart, our soul is dehydrated. But as has been shared thus far through this children's story, through the songs, there is good news that we don't have to live with a dehydrated heart. God invites each of us to treat the thirst of our souls as we do the thirst of our bodies. I will ask if they can move it to the next slide. I always do tend to have a few technical glitches to start. So Jesus says in John 7, verse 37, if anybody is thirsty, let him come and drink. Again, he says, if anybody is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask now that you would come, that you would speak to the hearts of your people. Lord, I am simply a vessel feeble as I am, I ask, Lord, that you will use me so that your name will be glorified and hearts will be drawn closer to you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please bear with me as I will remove this other microphone because I don't think it's going to be working. Thank you very much. So we said already that water is necessary for our bodies. Now how long can the average person live without food or water? First of all, food. 30 days. And now water? Three days. Well, imagine that one person actually lived three to four weeks without water. He was the longest, or he is, the longest survivor without water, and indeed it is considered a miracle. This miracle occurred during the earthquake of 2010 in Haiti, and I know many members in our congregation can associate with 
the trying times that took place uh, during that year. So this gentleman was 27 years old of age when this earthquake took place. He was a father of two children, and as a struggling rice seller in a poor Haitian market, he left for his job on that particular day as any other day. Everything seemed okay. Everything was going as normal as he entered into the town. But then he started to see buildings collapse. Walls fell on his right, on his left, preventing his escape. People were screaming all around him, and everything was quite terrifying, especially as a piece of concrete started to fall towards his face. But then something amazing happened. He felt as though someone had pulled the concrete away. And while this was good, he was still nevertheless stuck in darkness because there was concrete on his right, concrete on his left. He was able to breathe, but he was not able to move. And he was fearful to move, lest he would be injure himself or cause further movement of the concrete. But he heard around him on that first day many cries, but then the cries started to cease, and it became eerily silent. When he was finally pulled from the devastation, the rescue team reckoned that he had been there trapped for 27 days without food or water. 27 days. He, however, did not know how long he had been there because he lost track of time or the perception of time as he was falling in and out of consciousness. It was said that he lost 20, 27 kilograms, which is the equivalent of 60 pounds, and was only 88 pounds or 40 kilograms when he was rescued and then brought to the Tampa General Hospital in Florida. He was probably the longest ever earthquake and without water survivor. Now people reckon that he must have had access to water somehow, some way, in order to be able to survive that length of time. But he insists he did not. He said, however, that what he did have access to is sewage water. And now, as disturbing as that might seem, he said he did try to taste it, but it made him sick to his stomach. So what he did was that he wet his lips. Did this help him to survive? It is hard to say. He himself gives credit to God for his survival when he tells this story. He says, I was resigned to death, but God gave me life. The fact that I'm alive today isn't because of me. It's because of the grace of God. It's a miracle. I cannot explain it. Now, isn't that a statement that we can all identify with? We are here by God's divine in grace and by his mercy. And we should thank God for that on a daily basis. He says, if, this or, if, if his ordeal taught him anything, it is that hope springs eternal. He says, now I must live the best I can each day. Now this story reminds me that we all face different challenges in our lives. And when a crisis comes, we are tested for our spiritual survival. At the time of crisis, we are all thirsty. Not only for immediate satisfaction of our physical needs, but also for another kind of water. We long for water that can refresh us when our lives are falling apart. The water that can sustain us when all hope seems to have been lost. This need for this type of water can even surpass the physical water. Now it's interesting to note that the Bible addresses the need for the human need and thirstiness for this kind of water. In spiritual terms, there is no need for us to become the longest ever without living water survivors. God has shown us the source of fresh and living water. Living water from Jesus is free and available 
to all who are thirsty today, to all who are prospering, or to those who are in crisis. God desires to see us coming for it regularly, each day, since it is essential for our spiritual well-being and our survival. Now, there are a handful of passages in the Bible that speak to living water. And two such passages were read by a lovely young Emmy this morning. So thank you very much. And so we'll look at the two passages. The first one being found in John 4, verse, sorry, John 4. So let's turn to John 4. And seeing as it is Women's Emphasis Day, we will spend a few minutes looking at this very well-known passage of scripture of the woman at the well. So the first thing that we can learn, I think there are quickly four lessons that we can learn, is that the woman came to the well. She came because she needed water. It says in verse 7, then came a woman of Samaria to draw water. So she realized that she had a need, and she came to the source, which at that time was the well of Sakhar. Or sorry, the Jacob's well, which is found in the region of Samaria. So the second lesson that we can learn is that Jesus took time to speak to the woman. Now this is a very important uh, element of the story because if we go back to that particular time in history, one, Jews did not speak to Samaritans. There was a, a great divide, if you will, between the two. And Jews, in fact, did everything possible to avoid passing through Samaria. But it is said that Jesus intentionally went through. And we can read that in John 4, verse 4, where, he says, where it says, And he had to pass through Samaria. So Jesus intentionally went to Samaria for this particular divine appointment. Now, isn't it beautiful to know that God is seeking and searching after us in our day-to-day -day lives? To me, that is ever so touching. We continue on in verse 7, where, again, it says that there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, I like the readings of Ellen G. White because she provides further clarity on some of the interactions that take place. So I would invite you to, if you are interested, to read The Desire of Ages, particularly in the section that begins from 183 onwards, where it, it really does shed light on this interaction between Jesus and the woman at the well. So as the women of Samaria approach, and semen, seeming unconscious of his presence, she filled her pitcher with water. As she turned to go away, Jesus asked her for a drink. The king of heaven, now isn't that amazing? The king of heaven came to this outcast soul, asking a service at her hands. He who made the ocean, who controls the waters of the deep, who opened the springs and channels of the earth, rested his weariness at Jacob's, Jacob's well and was dependent upon the kindness of a stranger to give him water. I think that as we interact with others, we know that Jesus can do many, interaction, or many interventions directly, but he gives us the opportunity to partner with him in reaching out to that one person who might not know Christ otherwise. So as we see and as we have opportunity, we are to take these so, because we do not know the impact that that smile, that hug can have on someone else. Now, as I said, Jesus took time to speak with the woman. And as he was speaking with her, we see that Jesus began to tell her of things about her own life that many others didn't know. He said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. 
And the woman answered, I'm reading from verse 17, and answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now imagine someone speaking to you and speaking things that you know are private. So you can only imagine and use your mind's imagination of how this woman must have reacted when she realized that Jesus or this person that she saw, or as she said, perceived to be a prophet, was telling her things of her life. It was as though a mysterious hand was turning the pages of her life story and bringing to view what she had hoped would be forever hidden. Who was this who was telling her the secrets of her life? So now Jesus had her attention. But the point that I want us to take away from this is that Jesus understood her pain. He understands her, understood her needs. And it's the same with us. When we go to him, he understands our situation. He understands what we're going through. Now again, Ellen G. White speaks or sheds further light on this particular interaction. And it says in Desire of Ages, 189, page 189, as the woman talked with Jesus, she was impressed with his words. Never had she heard such sentiments from a priest of her own people or from the Jews. As the past of her life had been spread out before her, she had been made sensible of her great want. She realized her soul thirst, which the waters of the well of Sakkar could never satisfy. While the very purity of her presence her pre Jesus' presence condemned her sin. He had spoken no word of denunciation, but had told her of his grace that could renew the soul. She began to have conviction of his character, and, and she questioned, might not this be the long-looked-for Messiah? She said to him, I know that the Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus answered to her, I, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, when the woman realized that she was speaking to Jesus Christ himself, she decided that she was going to go back to the city and tell others. So one, she had an encounter with Jesus, and in her encounter, she was determined to go speak to others. And so this is the third lesson that we can each learn. If we go to verse 27 in chapter 4, it says, sorry, verse 28, so the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and were coming to him. Now, I think that this is a very important lesson that we can each learn. Because note that she, the woman who came to the well with her water pot, suddenly left her water pot. So to underscore, she came to the well to look for water. But then she left the well without the water and without giving Jesus the water that he had asked for. Now, why is this? And the answer is because she was satisfied. After speaking with Jesus, and Jesus satisfied her true thirst, the woman had been filled with joy as she listened to Christ's words. Leaving her water pot, she returned to the city to carry the message to others. Now, leaving her water pot spoke unmistakably to the effect of his words on her heart. It was the earnest desire of her soul to obtain that living water. And so she forgot the errand for which she had originally come for. She forgot the Savior's thirst. With her, her heart overflowing with gladness, she hastened on her way to impart to others the precious light that she had received. So we can see here that when we encounter Jesus, nothing else really matters. There are many who... In the world, we see stars and, and famous people who, despite the riches, despite the success, still seem to be empty, 
still seem to be longing for something. And we have the opportunity to be in that relationship with Jesus Christ who can fill our every need, who can fill our every desire. So there are false thirsts, some of the thirsts I've just alluded to, of money, of fame, of success. But there is a bigger thirst, which is the thirst of our soul. And once that is quenched, we are full and can share with others. So this is the last point that I wanted to share on just the first meeting of chapter four, John chapter 4. And that is that she witnessed. So after she was filled, uh, sorry, after she met Jesus, after she was filled and she was over full, she went and she shared with others what she had received from him. She pointed others to Jesus. The scripture reading says, come see a man which told me of all the things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Her words touched the heart of those she encountered in the marketplace. There was a new expression on her face, and this drew them to find out who it was that she was speaking of. So this woman represents the working of the practical faith in the life of Christ. Practical faith in Christ, my apologies. Every true disciple born of the kingdom of God is a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes the giver. Now the second text that I wanted to focus on is found in John chapter 7. And it reads, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anybody is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed were to receive. Now, what is the context of this statement? It was during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, as I was preparing uh, for this message, I had to go back myself and say exactly what was the Feast of Tabernacles. So we find some clarification in Deuteronomy. So firstly, this was a feast, or as we know, the Jewish nation was required to assemble at Jerusalem for religious purposes. There were three key feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now God, Israel's invisible leader, had given them direction in regards to these gatherings. So we'll look briefly at these directions. And they are found in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 16, beginning at verse 13. So Deuteronomy 16, verse 13 to 17. So the command is given. You shall celebrate the Feast of Boots. So the Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Boots. Seven days after you have gathered in from your thresh threshing floor and your wine vat, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants, and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your towns. So essentially, everyone. Seven days you shall celebrate the feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the works of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year all males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Boots. And they shall, appear before the, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. 
So we can see here that the Feast of Tabernacles was the last feast of the year. And it was the most beautiful one because it was a time of celebration of, of all that God had done and given to the people. So during this time, it was, as I said, it was a feast of seven days. And they lived in tabernacles. And the reason for that, it was to commemorate the fact that while the nation of Israel was coming out of Egypt, that they had also lived in booths. So there are several functions that the Feast of Tabernacles played for the nation of Israel. There are five that we will look at very briefly today. And then, as I'm sure you're wondering, well, why is she talking about this? I want to tie it to how it's relevant to us in the 21st century. So first of all, there was, the Feast of Boots was a time of gratitude. It was during these days that people thanked the Lord for his care and for his blessings in the past as well as in the present. They remembered how he protected the people of Israel and cared for them during their journey. Now, as we know, as the nation of Israel was journeying out of the land of Egypt, the Lord provided for them manna from heaven. Now, imagine getting food from heaven every single day. That itself is an amazing testimony of God's provision. And we do indeed every day are blessed by the many things that he provides for us. Now, when they had gathered, or when the harvest had gathered, they had an opportunity to express their gratitude to the Lord and the blessings during the year by bringing goods of the harvest to the Lord as a token of gratitude. So second, the feast was a universal gathering. As was read in the scripture reading, all young, old, rich, poor, living in the north, living in the south, living in the east and the west, inside or outside, were all to come to Jerusalem and reunite with God's people. Thus from all corners of Palestine and from the countries in which they dwelled, they were to come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. This feast is also a symbol of the heavenly gathering, the future Feast of Tabernacles, where all the redeemed will be gathered together on the sea of glass. There will, be place, there will be a place for all, for the rich, for the young, and for the old, from the east, from the north, and the south. All will be precious and equally wel welcomed in the heavenly promised land. And that is something that we can all eagerly look forward to. Third, the Feast of Tabernacle was also a symbol of the temple character of, of the life on earth. Now, what do I mean by that? The days and nights in the booths during this beautiful holiday were to remind them that their life in the wilderness, and more importantly, point that they're still on a journey to the promised land, that even now they were not home yet. Moreover, the regularity of the, tab the Feast of Tabernacles was to remind them and again and again, that earth was not the final destination. They were to continue until they saw their Savior face to face. Fourth, the Feast of Tabernacle was a holiday filled with joy, peace, and beauty. Now by God's wisdom, the Feast of Tabernacle fell after the Day of Atonement. So if we look in Leviticus, we don't have time to read it, but just quickly, in Leviticus 27, it tells us that on the 10th day of the seventh month, the nation celebrated the Day of Atonement. On the 15th day of the seventh month, they celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles. So once they approached the Feast of Tabernacles, they had already been cleared and cleansed from their sins and were able to fully enjoy this holiday with gratitude because there was no obstacle to their rejoicing. Now, I just wanted to pause quickly on the dimension of being at peace with the Lord and rejoicing in his presence. Again, Ellen G. White describes it as such, uh, from Desires, Desire of Ages, page four, four, 448. It says, the temple was the center of universal joy. 
the multitude of worshipers waving their branches and palm took up the strain and echoed the chorus. At night, the temple and its courts blazed with artificial light, and the music, the waving of the palm trees, the glad hosannas, the concor grand concourse of people over whom all light streamed from the hanging lamps. This scene deeply impressed the beholders. So you can use your mind's imagination to see houses dotted all over the city, tree, um, palm trees or palms being waved in the air, people singing. It was a glad time of rejoicing. So the beauty of the holiday filled with music, with songs, with Levite choir, temporal ceremonies, pointed to the harmony and the beauty that we will see in the presence of the Lord that he brings to the lives of his people. So quickly to recap, we have looked at four aspects of the Feast of Tabernacles. Firstly, that is a time of gratitude. It's a universal gathering. It's a temporal sign or indicator of our life uh, is the, the temple character of our life, as well as a time of peace, joy, and beauty. And lastly, the Feast of Tabernacles was to remind the people about God's presence, both in the past as well in the future. It was to remind them about Him being the source of salvation and the source of living water. And this is where I want to focus our few minutes So to this end, there was a special ceremony that opened the Feast of Tabernacles. And Ellen G. White describes it as follows. At the first dawn, the priest stood on a long, sounded a long, shrill blast upon the silver trumpets and the answering trumpets and the glad shouts of the people from their boots echoing over the hill and valley welcomed the festal day. So this was the first day. Then the priest dipped from the flowing waters of the Kidron, a flagon of water, and lifted it on high while the trumpets were sounded. He ascended the broad steps of the temple. So now you have to use your imagination of the trumpets being sounded, and now the priest is lifting the flagon of water and lifting it up the steps as the people sing and celebrate. So the flagon, in case some might be wondering, what is that? It's a large vessel that is used to contain water. So there were two silver basings, and there was a priest standing in each one. And the flagon of water was poured into one, and a flagon of wine was poured into the other. And the two joined together and was conducted towards the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. This, dis this display of consecrated water represented the fountain that at the command of God gushed from the rock, had gushed from the rock to quench the thirst of the children of Israel. So you might remember as the, ch the children of Israel were journeying, journey journeying to the land of Canaan, they needed water, they were lacking water. And so Moses was instructed to, to hit the rock. And in so doing, the water gushed forth from the rock. This ceremony was performed daily during the Feast of Tabernacles and represented Christ as the rock from which the children of Israel received water in the wilderness and also as a sacrifice for their daily salvation. Jesus the Messiah was the center of this holiday. That rock was a symbol of him who by his death caused living streams of salvation to flow to all who are athirst. Now, in smiting Christ, Satan had sought to destroy the Prince of Life, but from the smitten rock there flowed living water. So I invite you again to think, to use your mind's imagination, to imagine the last day now of this festival. festival. So the nation of Israel has celebrated, they have rejoiced, they have brought their gifts to the Lord during the festival of tabernacles. But now on the last day, the last morning, which is where we find our reading, the morning of this last day found the people wearied 
from the long season of festivity. Ellen G. White writes that the people had been engaged in continual or a continued scene of pomp and festivity, the eyes dazzled with the light and color, and their ears regaled the richness of the music, but there had been nothing to meet the need of the wants of the spirit, nothing to satisfy the soul. It was on this last day of the holiday that Jesus suddenly lifted up his voice in tones that ran across the courts, and he said, if anybody is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. Now, we read again in Elegy White that these, those who attended and heard of, these, the, of the statement from Jesus were greatly impressed, or the statement made a deep impression on them. Many of those who heard Jesus were mourners, over disappointed hopes. Many were nourishing a secret grief. They were seeking to satisfy their restless longing with things of this world and the praise of men. But when all had been gained, they found that they had toiled to only reach a broken cistern from which they could not quench their thirst. Now, can anyone relate to this, that on the outside, we might seem as though everything is okay. We're in a festival spirit, but on the inside, there is a longing, there's a need that we need to have quenched. I think many of us can sympathize with this situation. As Jesus spoke to the people, however, if any man thirsts, it kindled in their hearts a strange awe and many of them were ready to exclaim, as the woman at Samaria, give me this water so I will thirst no more. Jesus knew and still knows now that the wants of the soul, the pomps and riches and honor cannot satisfy the heart. So now, what about us? Because you're probably saying, okay, well this is wonderful. You've given us a good summary of the Feast of Tabernacles, but how is that relevant to me today, living in the 21st century? Well, it is still relevant to us today. Through the feast, God speaks to us. The symbols of the feast should become a reality in our lives to those who are going to the feast of the sea of glass and who will drink from the rock. Now, what is the sea of glass that I'm speaking of. As Christians, as believers, we believe that Jesus is coming again. Therefore, we are looking forward to a new kingdom, a new world. And as we look forward to this, there are principles that we can learn from the Feast of Tabernacles that can take us on our journey towards the heavenly kingdom. Those who drink of the living water will manifest in their lives the principles of this great holiday. And so we will look very quickly at the five principles that I just shared as to how they relate to us today. So again, the five principles were gratitude, a universal character, or universal gathering, I should say, was also that there would be peace, that there would be peace, joy, and beauty, and lastly, that we would be streams of living water. So firstly, gratitude. How often, and this is a rhetorical question, how often do we remind ourselves that all good things come from our Father who is in heaven. James 1.17 tells us, every good thing, is it some things? No. Every good thing given and every perfect gift coming down from the Father from whom there's no variation or shifting of shadow. So how often are we thankful for all that we have, even if our neighbor has a better car? even if someone else has something else that we would have liked to have for ourselves. 
we are encouraged to still be thankful for God will supply all of our needs. So do we share our gratitude and testimonies with the people around us? I will just pause quickly to share a very simple um, testimony of something that happened to me at work. It's very simple in the fact that I, was coming, I came to church and my colleague who sits across from me knows that I go to church. But what I found very uh, unique was the fact that she came to me on the Monday after the weekend and she said, do you go to the church on Woodruff? And I said, yes, how do you know it's the one on Woodruff? And she goes, because I got a ride uh, from a taxi driver who goes to your church. And I said, but this is very interesting. How did you make that connection? So the taxi driver told her of his story. And would you know that I happened to have been sitting next to that person on that particular Sabbath? So it just goes to show that we don't know the impression that we can have or the impact that we can have on someone else when we just share a very simple, you know, how was your weekend? My weekend was great. I went to church. We don't know what that can leave for that person who is hearing and how that can see that has been planted can take fruit later on. The second principle th that we can take from the Feast of Tabernacles is that we rightly understand and contribute to the universal character of God's kingdom. Jesus said that if anybody thirst, now with anybody, there's no racial, social, or religious limits. The water is free to all who would desires. But Paul has said to us, how are they to believe in whom they have never heard and how are they to hear without someone teaching them? This is taken from Romans 10, verse 14. So the question to each of us is, how, when we interact with others, do we take the opportunity to lead them to Christ? Now, I'm not speaking of grandiose gestures, but just a simple, as I said, when you go to work on a Monday morning or you go to school, to say, I went to church this particular weekend. And that can start... Uh, discussion. So as was said, the water is free to us all, but we are to share once we are filled, as the woman as the, at the well was filled, to share with others so that they can also come to know Jesus Christ. The third point that we can take away from the Feast of Tabernacles is that we understand the temporal character of our life here. Now someone has said that we all live on the bridge that connects us to eternity, but we often forget this and build permanent houses instead of tents. Do we remember what really matters is that what we can take to eternity consists of our characters, children, and the people we love? There's nothing else that we can take. Let us make a priority and make sure that we're moving ahead on the bridge towards eternity together with those we love and care about. The fourth principle is the principle of joy, peace, and beauty. Now, have you ever noticed that those who are at peace with the Lord are usually very joy, joyful and are able to bring joy and encouragement and beauty to the lives of those who surround them? If you don't find it in your heart to sing praises to the Lord, to share joy and beauty with the others, think about your own day of atonement. When was the last time, or how long ago, sorry, did you have it? Do you, are you in need of a day of atonement? Do you feel forgiven and forgiven? It is said also that those who hurt usually hurt other people. Broken vessels cannot be a source of living water. Broken cisterns cannot hold living water. Well, dry wells cannot give living water to those who are thirsty. Thus, we need to be at peace with the Lord to be able to enjoy our life and rejoice in the service with others and radiate that beauty and joy to others. And lastly, 
those who are going to the heavenly feast of tabernacles become themselves streams of living waters. So with the story of the woman at the well, again it was said that once she was filled, once she realized her need and received the living water from Jesus Christ, she then became a source of living water to others. So the lives of these individuals will demonstrate the fact that they are saved by grace and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We are praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. We are waiting for the latter rain, but are we doing our part to receive him? Are we drinking daily from the word of God in order to be filled with the living water and become living streams? When I think of this, I think of a picture, similar to the picture that was used by the woman. So the picture receives, as with all pictures, water from another source. As it receives water, there's two options. Either it could become a reservoir, which means that it keeps the water, or it could be used for a greater purpose, which is to be poured out to something, into something else. So my prayer is that we too would become pitchers, such that as we are filled with God's living water, we will pour out into others. So the last point that I want to draw out from the ta Feast of Tabernacles is the mixing of wine and water. So these two pictures are contrasted. The wine represents Jesus' sacrifice, the symbol of his death, the symbol of regeneration, new life, and the end of thirstiness, the symbol of the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the water, on the other hand, represents my apologies. The water represents the, the new life, the, the end of thirstiness, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the thing that I would like us to remember is that these two realities go hand in hand. So we too, on a daily basis, should die to self as Christ did, and rise again to be able to offer to others living water to, this, to those we come in contact with. So it asks you now, what springs do you drink from? Do you drink from broken cisterns, from other sources of living water, or do you drink from the living water itself? The world as we can see it now is dying in terms of all the conflict and all the strife, but we know that we can look forward to a new world. So we, Pastor Poulet preached on this recently about the fact that the signs that we see around us should not concern us because we know what God has said in his word and that we can look forward to a new day, a new kingdom. But as the world stands now and we see all that is around us, do we care for those individuals who might not necessarily have the joy, have the light that we have? Do we reach out to them? In his conversation with the woman of Samaria, Jesus emphasized the same thought when he said, everyone who drinks of the water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. How many souls are thirsting today? Living so close to the fountain yet so far from the wellspring. It's interesting to note that the woman at the well was looking back to the fathers, so she was looking back at Jacob, and then also looking forward to the Messiah's coming, while the hope of fathers and the Messiah himself was standing right by her, but she did not know. So he who seeks to quench his thirst from the fountains of the world will drink only to thirst again. Everywhere, as I said, men are unsatisfied. People strive to get all sorts of things to satisfy this desire of their soul or desire of their hearts. However, they long for something to supply the need of their soul. But there's only one person, only one that can meet that want. The need of the world 
the desire of all nations is Christ. And the divine grace which he alone imparts is living water, purifying, refreshing, and invigorating the soul. As the prophet Isaiah has said, the poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but the, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, God of Israel, will not forsake them. As we close, the story is told of a girl who underwent a, a surgery, and she was not allowed to drink for some time. She was in pain, she was thirsty. However, her mother refused to give her water to drink when she asked for it. The little girl did not understand this, for she wondered, why is it that my mother does not give me water to drink? However, the mother decided to follow the nurse's instructions. She dipped a piece of cloth in water and then wet the, her child's lips. She suffered with her daughter she wanted her to recover soon, and in so doing, she kept to the nurse's instructions. The little girl fell asleep and soon awoke with a cry, and her mother asked her, why did you cry? What did you dream about? The little girl said, I dreamed about an ocean. I went there, there was so much water, I wanted to drink, but it was so bitter and salty I could not. She sobbed. Why was there so much water if I could not drink it? Dear friends, unlike the little girl, we don't need to suffer thirst anymore. As I said, the Feast of Tabernacles is still relevant to us today. The cry of Christ to the thirsty soul is still going forth. It appeals to us even greater than those of who heard it in the temple day of the feast. The fountain is open to all. Those who are weary, exhausted, are offered a draught of the eternal life. Jesus is still crying. If anyone, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Let him that thirsts come. It is interesting to note that as we go to the end of the book of Revelation, in Revelation 22, verse 17, it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take water of life without cost. So we are invited, or Jesus invites us, to take fresh waters that can satisfy the thirstiness of our souls, satisfy and regenerate our souls and also transform our lives. The prophet Isaiah has said, the poor and needy search for water, but there is none, and their tongues are parched with thirst. But I, the Lord, will answer them, the God of Israel, and will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights, springs Within the valleys, I will turn the desert pools of water and the parched ground into springs. Now, isn't this an awesome promise from God? I don't know what you might have come here today with, with various challenges in your lives, with things, with hurts, with pains, with sorrows. But I did come to tell you that Jesus offers the answer. He offers the forgiveness that would be longing in your heart. He has paid it all, and it is a free gift to us to accept it. Pastor Baptiste last week spoke about the fact that Jesus can take our well, the somewhat well, and make it a well where we are victorious. Isn't that good news? And once we are victorious, this living water, Jesus Christ, will produce the invaluable fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives, such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. So let us all remember that we are on our way to the heavenly feast of tabernacles. May the symbols and the principles become our own spiritual realities today. May Jesus, who is the center of these symbols, become the center of our lives. May we respond daily to his invitation to come and drink, and the thirstiness and the longing of our souls will be met, our lives transformed into springs of living water that are springing up into everlasting life. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Andrea, for reminding us once again that Jesus is the living water, and without him, we can't move forward. So thank you for that message. Together, let us sing hymn number 511, I Know Whom I Have Believed. 511. Let us rise together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us here today. And as we go into the rest of the Sabbath and into this new week, I pray, Father, that you would speak to the hearts of all present here. 
that you would help us to be drawn into a closer relationship with you. Because, Lord, that is all that kingdom matters. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to be, receive the living water from you, and in so receiving, to be springs of living water to someone else. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.